The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next on Life Today, actor and writer Susan Isaacs talks about her angry conversations with God and how to move forward during times when God feels distant. You need to find people who love God and will grieve with you and be angry with you on your behalf. And also, it just takes time. Anyone who's got a timetable, like, you've been sad for two months, it's time to stop it and be joyful in Jesus, that's not a safe person. <laughs> Welcome to Life Today. I'm Randy Robinson. Sheila Walsh is here. And we've got a fun program, but yet also a very profound program, I think. What do you think? Well, I love the title of this book. It's called Angry Conversations with God. It reminded me of the Psalms. Sometimes you just get to be real with God. And so please welcome our guest, Susan Isaacs. So great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, you actually are by trade, um, a playwright and a comedian? Uh, I'm an author, a comedian, and an actor. Wow. And I also teach screenwriting at Chapman University. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Now, I have to say, when your book came across my desk, I was like, OK, I have no idea what this is about, but I want to meet this woman. Because the, it's a very intriguing title. Thank you. Because I think we're brought up to think that you're not supposed to have angry conversations with God. Yeah. And yet we live in a world that is very difficult and life can be very challenging. What prompted, what was the genesis of this? Well, in one sentence, um, I read the book of the Sacred Romance and they said, your marriage, your, your relationship with God is like a marriage. And I'm like, well, then we need to go to counseling because <laughs> we're not getting along. Um, and in one year, my father died, my mother had a stroke, my acting career completely tanked in, Los An in New York, so then I went back to Los Angeles only to watch it die there too. And this happened as my four best friends in New York all got their big acting breaks. Um, in fact, one of my best friends in New York got cast on a hit television show in Los Angeles, a show that was created by my high school sweetheart. Wow. Uh, oh, it gets worse. Okay. Um, they all got married um, in New York, just as the relationship that I was in for three years fell apart. And so I flew back to New York to attend the weddings. And when I got off the plane, I prayed, God, I'm, whatever you have for me today, help me to see where you are and what you have for me. And a friend from church, um, a churchy friend, if you know what I mean, who always had a verse to throw at you, she wanted to take me to Central Park to like remind me that the sun was still shining and God was still on the throne. And I started to feel like, okay, yeah, God's in control. And right when I started to feel that, like 50 feet in front of me walked past my newly ex-boyfriend with his new girlfriend, and they stopped at a pretzel cart and started to make out. And Not I thought- Not a good day, really. <laughs> I was like, in a city of 12 million people, God orchestrated that. He must hate me. <laughs> he must be cruel. You know, it, it's interesting because obviously you've got a sense of humor yeah. and, and you approach life very much in, in that. And we will laugh through the show. But that's a very serious issue. A lot of people think that, that God is not good. Well, that's what happened. I realized that my perception of God was I did, I, I, everything fell apart and I, it got me to this place like, I don't know what God's like. I don't, because why would he have done that to me? I need to completely start from zero. So I went to a, a Christian therapist who's like, I just want to hear what he sounds like, you're God, like speak out loud. And he was a jerk. And I realized that the, my concept of God had gotten tweaked over time. Yeah. And I had to start from zero. And a lot of us think, because no one gets out of this world without going through hardship. And we tend to think that, I mean, some problems are obviously of our own making, but for the most part, you know, life is about suffering and joy, suffering and joy, and learning through the process 
And, you know, as Jay Vernon and McGee said, I know one place in town where there's no lying or cheating or sadness, it's the graveyard. Yeah. That's what it is to be alive. Yeah. And we then interpret the pain that we go through as like, what did I do wrong? Well, some things we've done wrong. But for the most part, that is just what it is to be human. And we have to rethink whatever struggle that we're in of God grieving with us, being angry at the hurt that's done to us, and saying, let me carry it and let me get you through it. Susan, take me back to your early spiritual roots. Mm. Like, what was your upbringing and where do you think you picked up concepts of who God was mm. that you discovered later that's not who he is? Well, I think, I mean, I grew up in a really wonderful Lutheran church where Jesus was really alive. Um, but I do think that I got some of my concept, especially God the Father being like, really, you again? You know, of course he had a British accent because he was just really, you know. <laughs> and then he was like, oh, I can't even deal with you. And believe it or not, I actually got that, some of that from my mother because she was going through postpartum depression. She had me very late. She was old enough to be my grandmother. Wow. Four kids, exhausted, and dealing with postpartum depression. So the first, and I, you know, obviously you can see I didn't, I was not what you would call a compliant, quiet child. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my mother was like, Lord, help me, help. I don't want her to see my grief and I can't deal with her. And wow. so that's, that's what- That's very painful. And my mother loved the Lord mm -hmm. so much and we healed all of that. But some of it was that, and I think some of it is just like great theology, uh, messed up parenting, uh, good parenting, messed up parenting, and I just assimilated a lot of it. And also I have to say, this is something that I came to realize in my book. It was really easy to paint God as a jerk because then it left me off, the, I got off the hook. You're just a jerk, rather than, okay, maybe some of it's your fault, some of it is just life, and that, you know, maybe these things happen regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're doing things right or not, it's just life. But by painting God as a jerk, I could then push him away and say, you're a jerk, so, rather than, no, actually, I'm really good, and there's horrible things in the world that happen. And come on, these are middle-class white girl problems. These aren't like ter super bad tragedies. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious though, so when, when you, your life's falling apart, mm -hmm. you're mad at God, mm -hmm. you go to marriage counseling, mm -hmm. and you start vocalizing what God is like, mm -hmm. the jerk in mm -hmm. your mind, what, what did that sound like? Well, he was like, really, Susan, you're not in, you know, the Sudan, so, so get over yourself. A, uh, a unimpressed God, a judgmental God, and was he angry at he you? He was. Like you were angry at him? Too tired of me to be angry. So you had the old father God. That's worse, that's apathy. It is worse, yeah. it was apathy, like, oh God, really? But, th that, and I, that's when I, when that came out of my mouth, I'm like, I know, and I know intellectually that's not what God is like. <laughs> so how did you find out what he was really like? Well, a lot of counseling, a lot of angry conversations, a lot of just venting. And when I got all that out in front of God, he wasn't surprised or shocked. He was like, there you are. Okay, okay, now we can have a real conversation. And guess what? I'm mad too. Wow. I grieve with you. Mm. I'm sad. Mm. I'm mad. Too. And I, in it, sort of in the counseling thing, it's sort of like as I got that out, I could almost hear God saying, can you stop speaking for me? Because I would like to actually speak in my own voice with my own words. Mm -hmm. and, he, and, you know, because he was like, <clears throat> you know, husbands, can I get a word in edgewise, please? Um, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Nor do I, for the record, honey. And I was shocked. I think so often we have to realize, you know, God, I don't know what you're really like. Right. What did he, what did he say to reveal himself to you? And how did you know it was him? Well, he stopped speaking entirely. And all my life from a very young age, I could feel the Holy Spirit. I could sense God's presence. But in this period of time, it was like nothing. I thought, there's no God, there's no meaning, I, I don't know anything, 
I was, I had a meltdown. And I had, I had a really great pastor who was like, I got it, you can come in here and just, you know, vent as much as you want. I'll be there. And eventually I had to get it to a place where I'm like, if I never get what I want out of life, I have to love him anyway. If I never hear from God again, I have to love him anyway. I just, if it's like Mother Teresa and I hear him on my deathbed, fine. And I had to come to a, kind, a dark night of the soul, a death of all my expectations. And it's like, I almost felt like I was saying, oh, if this is a marriage, you married me for my money, for what wow. you could get out of me. Mm. And then he stopped talking. And I had to get to that place of saying, Yet I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last I shall stand on the earth, and though my flesh burn off me, yea, I will see God. And I had to be that. So you were left with nothing but your faith. Oh, oh no. I, I was like, I don't have a faith, or, but God yeah. has a faith for me. You have, okay. And okay. I was still the church. I never gave up. But I was asleep. I woke up. I thought I heard someone yelling my name outside my window, and I woke up and realized it was God. It's the only time I've ever heard an audible voice. And uh, you know how, I forget which prophet describes the voice of many waters. It was like someone speaking, and when they spoke, they covered every single tone mm -hmm. in the audio spectrum at the mm -hmm. same time. It was the voice of many waters, and it terrified me. Mm. And it was over too soon. What did it say? Wow. Just your name. Just my name. Just I was like, and all the love and all the care and all the compassion and gravity of, I know you, I know your name, I know where you are. What is the best thing you discovered about who God actually is? He's nothing like I would imagine him. He is so, he is, he's so smart not to give you what you want. <laughs> He is so smart that he plays the long game with everyone. Whatever you're going through, however you make mistakes, however, and, and the fact that I could just rail at him and I felt like he just grabbed me in my arms and loved me. Yeah. Like, there is nothing we can do to shock, alarm, or upset him. He's crazy about us. It's pretty amazing, huh? Yeah, and that was not the God that was in my head. I, you know, he... He, he ruined my life, and it was the best thing that happened to me, really. <laughs> but I think a lot of us could say that. I mean, a lot of us could say at the point of our greatest undoing, we discovered what we've been longing for all our lives. Absolutely. A relationship with him based on nothing we brought to the table. Exactly. We don't bring anything other than he's like, I'm crazy about you. Well, what's it like to carry this point of view, this worldview, in, into the uh, L.A. world, the acting world, the... the that whole scene? Well, I always felt uh, sort of like too wild for the church, too tame for the world. I never <laughs> really, you know, fit in. Um, we like you just the way you are. <laughs> Thank you. Well, people are hungry. People are hungry for God, and they may be looking for it um, in other things. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier, like I had gone to a yoga studio and there's like a little statue of the Buddha and some other like Hindu and I was like, nah. and I felt God saying, Susan, the field are white with harvest. Mm -hmm. Pray that the Lord sends someone to the harvest. And I think like an improv, you play in improv, you, you never deny what someone else is saying. You add, you say yes and. So people are hungry and you say yes and, and you, um, yeah, you know, I'm um, in a couple of 12-step programs, and you know they say you can't convince someone to get sober absent. All you can say is, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me. Mm -hmm. So it's building relationships and having people see something different and playing yes and when their hunger for justice or love or connection with whatever else is out there or whatever words they're using, you say yes and. Yeah, affirming their need and yeah. then pointing them in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. because so. someone said to me, you cannot convince someone of heaven, but you can make them hungry for it. Mm. You know? I like that. Yeah. What would be the best way that we could pray for you? Well, um, I'm working on the second book right now. Awesome. And um, it's about finding love late in life at the 11th hour and all the really great and really terrible advice 
I was given by the secular and the church communities about marriage and intimacy. Um, and I really want to get wait. it finished. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I actually uh, took the eHarmony test and was rejected three times. Okay. You can get I didn't rejected? Know they did that. Oh, yeah, they're like, oh, we can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that was possible. Right? Is oh, yeah. she telling us the truth? Is that a part of the humor? No, I think you should. Well, serious. I found out later because some, it was a Fox Morning show, they had me on, and they had a guy from, from eHarmony. He's like, look, it's an algorithm. If you see the complexities in life and the, tr and, you know, variances and the grays, and you're a complex thinker, we can't help you. I'm like, that's why I'm a complex thinker. <laughs> <laughs> so. Look on the branch. Well, I'm like, I stand justified. But I did meet my husband online. Yeah. Yeah, You're on um, a site that was a disaster for a month, and then they kept saying, come back for five free days, come back for 10 free days, and I saw, I was like, I'm gonna drive by for the weekend, but here's my email, and that's how we met. Okay. Weight Watchers yeah. does that with me. Oh, really? Come back for five free days, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so far, Shame not. you for, like, oh, God, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you were to sum up, um, one of the most important things that you could say to people who are right now are where you were, you know, who are just like, you know what? I prayed and God didn't answer. Mm -hmm. I've prayed and the, the worst thing that could have happened, happened. How can you talk about a God of love when that's not his, how he's been with me? I would say keep railing, keep just empty it out. Find safe people mm -hmm. who can carry that with you. And like I said, my problems are middle-class white girls' problems. There are things that are far worse. And, so, and you need to find people who love God and will grieve with you and be angry with you on your behalf. Yeah. And you need to um, ask God to open your eyes. Where, where is he? If he's there, where is he? Because, you know, it's not like we're going to get someone calling our name or all of a sudden our, our fortunes reversed. But, and also it just takes time. Anyone who's got a timetable like, you've been sad for two months, it's time to stop it and be joyful in Jesus. That's not a safe person. <laughs> That's an annoying jerk. You heard right. it here, people. <laughs> Highlight material right there. <laughs> you know, I, I hear you though. I hear you in, in, in all of your, uh, a bit eccentric expression. I hear someone who says, you know what, I, I didn't understand God, but I desperately wanted to know him. And I, and I sought him out. And he met me on my own terms and spoke my own language to let me know how much he loved me. Is that a, is that a fair summation? That's a real play? sort of like ridiculous, uh, dis you know, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. No, no, yes, that's exactly it. It, and that God's like, I take it, I can take it, sure, I can take it, I can sure. take it, I can take it. The things that we bury because we don't think God can take it, that's like, I want that. I, you know, there's a, an adage, you're only as sick as your secrets. Hmm. And, you know, we underestimate the compassion and love and patience and understanding of God. We really yes. do. Yep, yep. We do. And, and he met me in all of that. I, that's exactly where I was going because he says, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. And so even in the times of fighting and, and wondering where are you, God, and what's going on and why hadn't that worked out, if we draw close to him, we'll, we'll find he draws close to us. It's a promise. And it's a, it's a beautiful testimony. There are a lot of people out there right now that um, are wondering where God is. And they're asking, and they're asking for help. Uh, and, you know, Sheila, we've been different places in the world, and we've, we've seen this. I, I was in uh, Cambodia on a water for life trip, not even looking for, for the sex trafficking uh, issues that we're dealing with. And it was there. It surprised us. But it's everywhere. It's in our own country now. Um, but we can be that answer for those people that are crying out saying, where's God? Why won't he intervene in, in, in some sort of way? Does he exist? Does he love us? I think God's looking at his people going, are you going to answer that call? Let me tell you, we can't answer that call, and I want to show you how. Please watch this. 
I'm here in a very remote part of Cambodia. There's nothing around here except for a few shacks. There's just not much here. And yet still, a human trafficker came through here many months ago and promised uh, this young lady's sister uh, a better life and some things, lured her away, and they haven't heard from her. She's, as far as they know, gone. They have her picture, and they have a prayer that she'll come back, a hope that they will see her again. She's uh, very likely being forced uh, to do things that, that no girl should be forced to do uh, in places that are not uh, fit for human living. This is the reality here and in, in places all over, all over the world. That's why Rescue Life is critical. Uh, we must first reach into places like this with education so that they'll know what to look out for when these predators come through. We must rescue the girls that we can and get them out of the sex trade. And we must restore them. We must give them a hope and a future. We can do that. We can do it on a larger scale, but we have to have your help. I pray that you will help us as we try to help so many girls. We have to stop this abuse. It's not right. You can do something. Join with us as we rescue life. You know, Sheila, the, the amazing thing was that they didn't know where she was. And, and when we started talking to people that knew, she had probably been taken out of Cambodia into an area. You, you've been to some of those areas where these girls are trafficked. And the, the hard thing, Randy, the, the, the devastating thing is that so many of these girls think they're going for a better life. Yeah, that's what they told You know, them. their parents yeah, yeah. Um, have no money. Sometimes there's only a mother. And so this girl is told, hey, just over the border, you're going to get a great job. You know, you can work in the food industry. It will be amazing. And the minute they get there, um, they're offered a meal. And so many of the girls that I talk to, their meal is drugged. And they wake up in a small room with a man that they've never met in their life before. And they realize that they are a prisoner. And it's, it's the most devastating reality. Uh, all of our missions impact me, but I have to tell you that our rescue life has left a profound impact on me because this is evil from the pit of hell. These people are so well organized and it's innocence. It's little girls. I talked to so many little girls who said to me, you know, at night I would lay there and it would be the sixth or seventh man that would come in. She said, sometimes I would say, God, if there is a God, will you please send somebody to help? And we can do something. That's the thing. It's we have to be as organized as they are because they're very organized, but we can do something. We have partners on the ground in Southeast Asia where once we've reached these girls, once we've rescued them, there's a place to take them to restore. But it, it means that we all have to do our part, Randy. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we approach this thing because it's a big problem. Reach, rescue, restore. We reach in there. We, we, we tell young children what signs to look out for so that they don't get caught, they don't get duped. Uh, we rescue ones that are that are already in it, like like Sheila, like I know you sat and <laughs> hugged these four girls and, and it, it just breaks your heart and makes, as a father, makes me angry at the same time. We kicked down doors at midnight and brought five girls out. Amen. And we restore, we give them a hope, we give them a future. And literally that means oftentimes giving them skills, giving them something to do. Uh, a way to earn a living. And in fact, Sheila, would you show them your bracelet? Because I love this. And it's just a thank you. The girls that yeah. we've taken out and rescued, um, we actually, they make these. And for any gift at all, right. we're going to send you one of these. I'm praying that God will so restore the souls of these girls that they will rise up to become prayer warriors in their nations yeah. and see God use their lives to make a difference. But we need you to help us. Make the best gift you can. Uh, it's when we do the, you know, we've done this for a few years now, Sheila. So we have an idea of how much it kind of costs on average to get a, a, a child out of this. And it comes out to $128. We've got a wonderful matching gift right now where if a $64 gift will have the same effect. But here's, here's the bottom line. We can do something. All of us can do something. And the more of us that do something, the more we can reach in there and rescue and give hope and get these people, these young, mainly girls, out of, 
out of hell on earth. Will you go online? Will you go to the phone right now? Do what you can and know that when you join and rescue life, you really are rescuing lives. Do it right now. Behind the bright lights, there is a darkness where a world of innocence is lost and abuse runs rampant, scarring the souls of children with no one and nowhere to turn for help. With bodies broken and hopes crushed, these young victims are trapped in a never-ending nightmare. Today, you can shine the light of God's love in this dark world to reach, rescue, and restore these young ones to the life God designed for them to live. With a generous $250,000 matching gift, now your gift of $128 to help reach, rescue, or restore one child can be double to help two children. Your $64 gift will be matched to help save one child from the horrors of human trafficking. And a $32 mission rescue gift will be doubled to $64. With your gift, we'll send you this beautiful freedom bracelet, handcrafted by survivors of human trafficking who want to say thank you for helping those still trapped. Wear it as a wonderful reminder to pray for the outreach. With your gift of $128 or more, you'll receive the Freedom Tote. This quality canvas tote bag is made by trafficked survivors who are now learning a new trade and includes spiritual life resources such as books, devotionals, CDs, or DVDs. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,280, which will now help rescue 20 children. And you may request our beautiful new bronze sculpture, A Mother's Strength. Please call, write, or make your gift online I pray you will make the best gift you can, $128 if you can, $1,280 if you can. If God has given you the means, by gosh, this is a great place to do something great for the kingdom. Sheila? Yeah, really will. So the line's busy. Just keep calling. Um, let's do this in Jesus' name. And That's would right. you help me thank our guest, Susan Isaacs? You are a pistol. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time on Life Today. God bless. Sheila Walsh helps us understand that we are victorious because of Christ. The one who rose from the dead is praying for you right now. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.